Welcome to Calvary Temple Church, here in the heart of downtown Winnipeg. Calvary Temple is people, people of all generations and all nations. Stay tuned for a message of hope and encouragement. Thank you for joining us today at Calvary Temple in this, the new fall season of our ministry on television. I'm so delighted that you are joining us today. In just a few moments, I'm going to take you into the sanctuary where Ruth Graham, the third child of Billy and Ruth Graham, is going to share a very profound message on the theme, In Every Pew Sits a Broken Heart. And so let me remind all of us at the beginning of this fall season that Calvary Temple's television ministry is a viewer-supported program. We desperately need the help of people like yourself to partner with us so we can share this message of hope to the whosoever will. Thank you so much for joining us today. God bless you. Welcome to Calvary Temple today, and uh, we are delighted to have Ruth Graham with us. And she's going to share about the fact that sometimes there are broken hearts that sit in the pews of our churches. Ruth. Welcome. We're delighted to have you today. God bless you. Thank you so much. I am delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be in Winnipeg, and I want you to know that my father sends his greetings. He knows that I'm here, and he has very fond memories and love for Winnipeg. And if he were able, he would be here as well. But uh, many of you would like to know how he is. He is 95, going to be 95 uh, years old, and his body is slowing down. There are a lot of miles on that body. And uh, yet his mind is very good and he's very keen. He keeps up with everything that's going on, especially when it concerns the gospel. I have had a wonderful weekend here at Calvary Temple. We've had a wonderful time with the women. We enjoyed ourselves. We learned about each other. We learned about God. And this morning I want to share with you because I think perhaps you may be sitting in that pew and you're hurting. You have covered it over with a smile. You have told everyone who asked this morning, I'm fine, and you are smiling, but your heart is heavy. Everyone around you has been smiling, and you want to fit in, but you're sitting there feeling discouraged and overwhelmed about life. Maybe your life has collapsed in some way, I don't know what it is, but God does. You feel stressed and pressured. Maybe your story is messy like mine. Maybe you can say with the person that said, I have stood in sorrow's kitchen and licked every pan. God seems distant to you this morning. And you wonder where he is. You wonder if he's even listening to you. Everybody else seems excited about the Lord, but you. You are here because you were expected to be. It's Sunday morning, so where else are you going to be but in church? Oh, I know there are other people who have lots of other places they go. But you're expected to be in church. Or maybe you're just curious to see what what Billy's other kid looks like. You smile and you hide behind your mask. You feel alone and isolated. We often quote the verse about God giving us the abundant life, and we really try to live that out as if it were a way around life's difficulties. But you know, the abundant life is a way through life's stresses, difficulties, struggles, and questions. The church's best kept secret is that in every pew sits a broken heart. Many people are struggling today. You know that well. All of us need grace and comfort just for everyday living, just getting up in the morning, going to work, tending to our families, coming home again, meeting the budget, paying the bills. We need God's grace and comfort. How can we define the struggles that we're in? 
I would say that we can often struggle when we decide to follow God with an undivided heart. We've made a decision for God. We've driven a stake. When we've dealt thoroughly with our sin, when we're trying to be honest with ourselves and with others, that can involve a struggle. Obedience can be a struggle. We certainly struggle when we are confronted with the things that we have not asked for, but have happened in our life. The tragedies, the illnesses, death, betrayal, rejection. And then, of course, we struggle with the consequences of our own choices and sin. The Bible says that we reap what we sow, and that is true. Perhaps your story is messy like mine. Maybe you're suffering the consequences of your own sin and choices like I have. Maybe you feel trapped by your sin and you just can't seem to get out. Let me just tell you this morning that there's an end to the harvest. God gives you an opportunity to plant a new crop and start over again. No matter what your struggle, God offers you this morning grace and comfort. Jeremiah, the great prophet of old, struggled. I love Jeremiah. He's one of my very favorite Bible characters. He was quite a man. He was a man's man. He was persevering. He was godly. He was honest. He was courageous. He was sensitive. Ladies, he was in touch with his feminine side. And he gives us two truths for us in our struggle. God is in control, and God offers his help and hope. You may remember the story of Jeremiah. He was sent by God to preach impending doom to a nation that did not want to hear it. He was not popular with his citizens. They didn't like the message. And he also made the enemy mad. So now he's got his people mad at him. He's got the enemy mad at him. He was not in a comfortable place. And he did this not for one Sunday, not for two Sundays, not for a month, but over 20 years he preached the same message of God's impending judgment because of their idolatry. They had disobeyed God, and God was going to punish them. Believe me, Jeremiah struggled with his call, with his mission, with his life. But he cared. He cared deeply about his people. He cared deeply about his message. The people plotted his death. They threw him in a well, left to starve. It was a struggle for Jeremiah. But one of the things I love about Jeremiah, and I hope you will too, is that he's honest. He doesn't take this lying down. He doesn't like this task. He wishes that God had ch changed, chosen somebody else. He argues with God. He questions God. This isn't something he wanted. Right off the bat, he told God, go find somebody else. Have you told God that? Go find somebody else. I did. I said, go find another Graham. But he didn't. God invites our honesty. He has a purpose for us, and he invites our honesty. He can work with honesty because, you see, he's bigger than our questions. He's bigger than our anger. He's bigger than our doubts. The difference between Jeremiah and me is that Jeremiah was obedient. Jeremiah did what God asked him to do, and he was faithful to God. He was faithful in his struggle. In spite of the rejection, the ridicule, the punishment, the loneliness, all of his struggle, in spite of all that, he was the one who wrote, the Lord's loving kindnesses never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. When did Jeremiah learn of God's faithfulness? when his stomach was growling because he was starving, 
When did he learn of his goodness and faithfulness? When he was at the bottom of that well? When he was bleeding? When he was bruised? Jeremiah gives us two truths. God is in control, even if we're at the bottom of the well. And God gives us hope and help, even when we're starving. Our struggle has not taken God by surprise. There is a purpose to it. And God does not leave us alone, even if we are at the bottom of a well. Even if we're in darkness, he has not left us alone. He is ready to help us. He's only a prayer away. Perhaps you are struggling, walking a road less traveled this morning because you have chosen to follow God with an undivided heart. You are misunderstood by your family and friends. They ridicule you because you are having to endure something you didn't ask for, and you are stunned, you are numb, or because you're struggling because of the consequences of your own sin, and you are full of regret. I have had to struggle with the things that I didn't ask for, but came my way. I also have struggled with the consequences of my own sin and choices. After years of infidelity, my husband and I divorced. He had been unfaithful for years without my being aware of it. I was stunned. I was shocked. I was numb. I didn't ask for this. It wasn't supposed to happen to me. But after 21 years, the marriage ended. During that time, my oldest daughter developed an eating disorder. My son began to dabble in drugs. My 16-year-old daughter sat beside me on my bed and told me she thought she was pregnant. That wasn't supposed to happen to me. I was Billy Graham's daughter. We lived in a perfect family, right? Wrong. These were struggling days for me. And I'm happy to report that my oldest daughter got help for her eating disorder and now has four children of her own. My son got help for his drugs, and he's a good businessman in North Carolina. And my youngest daughter did have her child out of wedlock. She released that baby for adoption. And 16 months later, she gave birth to a little boy, my grandson. Since then, she has married happily, and she has two more children. Her third child was born with serious birth difficulties. But you know, these are struggles. But God didn't, it was, didn't take God by surprise. He knew what was going to happen. And he has been with us every step of the way. God does not delight in pain. But in his economy, that's where the deep things are taught. And I don't know about you, but wouldn't you rather be ministered to by somebody who knows what the struggle's like? Those people who come in and tell you all the answers haven't a clue what the real questions are. I want somebody who has, talks to me who's known the struggle. Struggles strengthen us. Maybe not right away, but they do. They deepen our faith. God's knowledge of us is personal. He told Jeremiah that he formed him. The same is true for you. He knew Jeremiah intimately. He knows us intimately. He has appointed us for a purpose in life. He's personally involved. His fingerprints are all over your life. He knows you. Nothing has taken him by surprise. Will you believe that he is in control, that he's moving toward his purpose with all wisdom and all precision? God is not arbitrary. There are no afterthoughts with God. There is no breakdown of authority. There is no powerlessness with God. He doesn't look at your life and go, oops. God knows what he's doing. He knows his purpose, and he has an end in view, and that end is good. His purpose is always good. 
His timeline is eternal. My timeline is yesterday. I get impatient, but he has the bigger picture in mind. He told Jeremiah that he was in control. He is still in control today. He is still on the throne. I remember when the Twin Towers fell. My mother, I talked to my mother and she said, yep, but God's still on the throne. Isn't that a comfort? But God asked Jeremiah a question. He says, Jeremiah, what do you see? And Jeremiah sort of looks around and he sees what looks like sort of a, a dead bush, a, a dead almond branch. Not very impressive. But with God, that which looks dead has the promise of life. My struggle, your struggle, has the promise of good. And folks, that is hope. What you're going through is not pointless. God has a purpose, and it is a good purpose. He understands you. He knows you. He loves you desperately. He knows our weaknesses. He knows the decisions that we make and the reasons why we make it. And he doesn't condemn us. He wants to come alongside of us, to help us, to guide us. I love the verse, Isaiah 51.3. I will look with compassion on all her ruins. I know that's speaking of Israel, but I take it personally. How many of us think that God looks at us and frowns? God doesn't. His look is tender, compassionate, loving, gentle, and kind. He loves you desperately. I have struggled with the consequences of my own sin and choices. After a very ill-advised rebound marriage that lasted three months, I went home to see my parents. They had warned me. They told me not to do it. But I thought I knew what was best for myself. And it was a two-day drive, and as I drove home, questions swirled in my mind. What was my life going to be like? I had really blown it. What were my parents going to say to me? We told you not to do it. You've made your bed, now you lie in it. We're tired of fooling with you. What were you thinking? What's wrong with you? What were my children going to do? I couldn't undo my sin. I couldn't hide from it. As I rounded the last bend in my parents' driveway, I saw my father standing there. And as I got out of the car, he wrapped his arms around me and he said, welcome home. My father is not God, but that's exactly what God does for us when we come with our brokenness, our questions, our fears, and our doubts. He told Jeremiah that he was with him. He is with us. When the night is long and dark, he is there. He comes to us in our pain, in our loneliness, in our doubts. There's a story of a forest fire in Yellowstone National Park in the United States. It's after the fire and the, the um, park rangers are going looking for hot spots and they have a rod and they're knocking over the embers just to make sure that they die away. And this ranger knocked over this ember and four little baby birds fluttered out. And upon closer examination, he realized that that charred ember was the body of the maybe mother bird. Instinctively to protect her birds, she had come to the base of the tree, covered them with her feathers. And when the flames licked her body, she saved her babies. Psalm 57 1 says, In the shadow of your wings will I take refuge until the destruction passes by. Are you in the shadow of his wings this morning? Are you in his presence this morning? I know you feel the heat, but he takes the fire for you. 
He protects us. He is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. And ladies and gentlemen, you can take that to the bank. He gives us his word, his promises, his principles. And his promises and his principles are personal. He individualizes them for us. He told Jeremiah, don't be afraid. I am with you. I will deliver you. He still says that today. Do you know that fear not is the most often repeated command in Scripture? 365 times. I didn't count them, but I trust the person who did. God knows that each day we need to know that he is with us, that we need not fear. I wrote a book, Fear Not Tomorrow. God is already there. That is true. God is already in your tomorrow. But he delivers in his time and in his way. It's hard to wait in the dark when we're in pain. I read somewhere that the word wait doesn't mean like you're waiting for someone to show up. It means to wrap around, to cling, like a vine wraps around a tree. When you're waiting, wrap yourself around Jesus and his word and his promises. He wants us to go through the struggle. We grow strong in it. But he gives us a promise. Problems will not overcome you. The struggles will not undo you. I am with you to deliver you. He didn't say the problems won't come. He just said that he would be with us and they will not overcome us. He watches over his promises to fulfill them. He makes his promises alive and real that we can apply to our hearts and to our lives, useful. My mother used to say, all the promises of God on the believer's side. Claim them all. I had a man wrote me one day and he said, my son's going through a difficult time. What do I do? What promises do I claim? And I wrote him back, I said, claim them all. They're yours. Then God asked Jeremiah again, what do you see? And Jeremiah sees a, a boiling pot of stew. It symbolized judgment. To me, that says he's our vindicator. He is our justifier. Life is hard. Life is unfair. One day he will set it right. We can't do that. But our job is to trust to trust in the fire, to trust in the struggle, to trust in the dark. Nothing takes him by surprise. He is with us. He has given us wonderful promises. He is our vindicator. And we must remember that the only way he can vindicate us is through the cross of Calvary, the shed blood of Jesus. Are you struggling this morning for following God with an undivided heart, for obeying God's word? Are you dealing with what you have not asked for and you're stunned? Or are you struggling with the consequences of your own sin and shame? Will you trust that God is in control this morning? Will you claim his promises for your life? They are for you to take home, to apply. They are his gift to you. And when you leave here this morning, if you belong to him, he goes with you. And nothing that you face out there will take him by surprise. He will walk with you. And I pray that Isaiah 40, 1 through 3, will become your scripture in your life. I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. And he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me up out of a pit of despair, out of mud and mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. When you are struggling, God is with you. But his purpose is to glorify himself. May your life glorify the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do struggle. And we confess that we are not always patient. May we take these words 
your promises, that you are with us in the dark and in the pain and in the struggle and in the doubts. You never leave us, you never forsake us, you never abandon us, and you never reject us. And you are with us to help us, you guide us, and you will give us a song in our night. Oh, Lord Jesus, you walk with us. You know what it's like. You've walked this path as well. We want to glorify you this morning, and we want to sing a new song to you because, indeed, we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. What a marvelous encouragement for those of us walking in a difficult place. It's about the Lordship of Jesus. On page 213 of this New Testament, there is a prayer. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus Christ is your Son and that he died on the cross to save me from my sin. I believe that he rose again. I ask you, Lord, to come into my life and forgive me of my sin and give me eternal life. I invite you to come into my heart. I want to trust Jesus as my Savior. Now this New Testament, I have one for everyone here who wants one today. But it's important that you accept that Jesus loves you. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and to wreck your life, and Jesus comes to give you life. So I'm going to ask you to join me in a prayer today. Just pray this with me. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. And thank you for sending Ruth Graham to give us a living example of someone who has experienced pain but has known and proven you to be faithful. When we call upon the name of the Lord, you respond with compassion and love. So Lord, let someone pray this prayer today. Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of all my sin. I repent. I turn away from the past and I turn to you. Thank you, Lord, for coming into my heart today. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for watching the broadcast. An audio recording of today's message is available simply for the asking. Write, email, or call our toll free number and requested by the CD offer shown on the screen. Our program is viewer supported. It is people like you who help pay for the airtime. Thank you for your continued giving. We look forward to hearing from you. Please join us again next week for another episode of Calvary Temple Church. God bless you.